greetings and thank you for joining me for worship on this. This is our service for the second Sunday of after the Epiphany. Uh, we are in the season of Epiphany, which is the season of revealings, uh, revealing who it is that babe of Bethlehem, whose birth we celebrated uh, now nearly a month ago, uh, who that baby is. Because he is more than just a baby. And the day of Epiphany, uh, we discussed last week briefly, the day of Epiphany is the day uh, which tradition describes as the uh, arrival of the wise men with their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, revealing this babe to be king, uh, God, and sacrifice. And then last week, we had the, uh, uh, the baptism of our Lord, revealing him to be the Son of God with the, the one on whom the Holy Spirit rests as the as the uh, dove came in bodily form uh, at his baptism upon Jesus uh, and, and rested upon him. And today, now we hear uh, Jesus in his uh, first recorded sermon uh, saying, uh, going back to the prophet Isaiah and saying, I am the one, uh, the fulfillment of the one who in Isaiah said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And, and he is claiming that the, his messiahship uh, upon himself. So uh, another uh, revealing here in this season of, of epiphany, of, of revealings. So that's what we're looking at for today. We are in Luke 4, continuing our series through, the, uh, through uh, our survey of that gospel. And uh, so we pray that, uh, that uh, you are uh, blessed by this service, that in, in this uh, service that uh, the Lord God brings you a word of comfort and, and peace uh, for the week that lies ahead. As we begin our service now, uh, uh, let us do so with a word of prayer. Would you join with me? Uh, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, you sent your Son to proclaim your kingdom and to teach with authority. Anoint us with the power of your Spirit that we too may bring good news to the afflicted, bind up the brokenhearted, and proclaim liberty to the captive through your Son Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Will you join with me in our opening hymn? Thank you. 
The first reading for today is Psalm 100 and 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations, praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Holy Gospel for this day comes from St. Luke, the fourth chapter, beginning at the 14th verse. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. For the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed, except Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The Lord grace to you and peace from God the Father and from his Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus says. He had taken the scroll, literally the word here is Bible, which means book. Uh, the the uh, editors uh, and, uh, make that to be scroll because when we think of book, right, we think of a, a book with a front and back cover, the nice binding in the middle that you open like that. Uh, but rather, these uh, the scriptures would have been written on long parchments of uh, of long scrolls of parchment and so they they interpret that um translate it as scroll but they took the bible the, the, the scroll of the prophet isaiah which was our scripture reading back in mid-december he reads it and he says today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing 
Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You know, the, the Bible is about many uh, things. It's about many things. It is a historical record. It is a way of life. It is uh, about truth. It is about light. It is about hope. Uh, the Bible is about revelation, revealing the God who is hidden from our eyes that we might get to know him, uh, and his attributes, uh, his works throughout the ages, uh, the salvation that he has prepared for us in Christ Jesus. Uh, God reveals uh, himself through his word. Uh, and, and amongst other attributes is his faithfulness. Um, his faithfulness to his promises, even despite the faithlessness of his people. Uh, Christmas was about just such a faithfulness as God kept his promise, which he had made in many and various ways uh, through the prophets of old to send his excuse me, to send his Christ, his son, into the world. Uh, here we have another promise kept. Uh, back in December, we had a couple of readings about the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit was going to be poured out. It was going to be coming back into the world uh, and, and uh, bringing, making people to become children of God, uh, descendants uh, to Abraham, uh, Isaiah 61 being one of those texts. It's the text which Jesus uh, reads from the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. So that this, this pouring out of the Spirit begins with one person, Jesus Christ. Uh, and then we also had Joel 2. Uh, In those days, declares the Lord, I shall pour out my Spirit on all flesh. And where Luke is eventually uh, getting us toward, as he once he gets us through the gospel, um, his witness to the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, what he's going to do then is go into the book of Acts, which is about how the, 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 the apostles took this, this gospel into all the world. And where that begins, we have the ascension, and then is Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit comes down upon the twelve. Uh, and then, or excuse me, the yeah, the, the, uh, the 11, a 12 is added to them for Judas. But uh, the, the Holy Spirit comes upon those t on the, the apostles and then uh, poured out from there upon the, the 3,000 who on the day of Pentecost had converted. And it's just going to keep going out. And, and, uh, and so we have, what we have here is the beginning of this pouring out of the Spirit and another promise of God being kept. You know, the, the Spirit of God, the, the, the Holy Spirit, is very alive, very active already in Luke's Gospel. He is very much at work. Nobody is doing more work uh, in, in these opening chapters of Luke's Gospel than the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you haven't picked up that thread in our reading, though, let me uh, bring... Uh, to light, uh, uh, tie these uh, together for you, that this thread of activity of the Holy Spirit. In Luke 1 15, the angel of the Lord uh, told, uh, tells Zechariah that his wife Elizabeth would bear a son, and this son, who is John the baptizer, would be filled with the Holy Spirit and would turn the hearts of many in Israel to the Lord God. And in 135, the Holy Spirit overcame Mary, and she conceived Jesus in her womb. In 141, Mary's cousin Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit at Mary's visit, and she blesses her. In chapter 2, verse 25, we heard that the Holy Spirit had rested on a man named Simeon. He was a man who was advanced in years and uh, was expecting death to come soon. But in verse 26, the very next verse, the Holy Spirit had revealed to him that, uh, that Simeon would see the Lord's Christ before he died. And in verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 20 to 32, uh, Simeon, led by the Holy Spirit, goes to the temple... And there he comes across the Holy Family and he takes Jesus in his arms. He was there to, Jesus was there to be dedicated. They're offering uh, the sacrifices of purification for Mary. But he takes Jesus in his arms. He blesses the Lord with the words uh, which we call the Nucdemites. Uh, Lord, let your servant depart in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. Your promise has been fulfilled. 
In Luke 3.16, John the baptizer then foretells of one coming after him who had baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And at the baptism of Jesus in chapter 3, verse 22, the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in bodily form like a dove. In Luke 4, 1, we are told that, uh, we didn't cover this one, uh, but in uh, the opening of chapter 4, we're told that Jesus then, full of the Holy Spirit, having just been baptized, the Holy Spirit having come upon him, full of the Holy Spirit, was then driven out to the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted those 40 days by the devil. And finally, at the outset of our reading for today, chapter 4, verse 14, Jesus returns from the wilderness. He returns to uh, Galilee with the power of the Spirit to formally begin what is uh, what we call his public ministry. Ten occurrences of the Holy Spirit, and we are only in chapter 4. Nobody is on the move more at the outset of this gospel than the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we get a sense here of Luke's, uh, his pneumatology, his theology of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is one of those elusive things. We, uh, what, what do we believe about it? Uh, in the Creed, we make a very simple statement, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And then we are on from there. Although those things that, 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 um, that uh, follow that statement of faith, I believe in the Holy Spirit, are things that the Spirit nonetheless does. Um, but uh, anyhow, uh, we, we, our understanding of the Holy Spirit is... Uh, the, the Holy Spirit is not like Jesus, where we got a tangible person, we got tangible work. The Father who... Uh, intangible, but we, we grasp the fact that he is the creator, you know, Jesus the redeemer, the one who buys us back from sin, death, and the evil one, the one who overcomes death by his resurrection, gives us the hope of everlasting life. What does the Holy Spirit do exactly? Well, Luke gives us an understanding as to uh, the person and work of this third person of the Trinity. We see that the Spirit of God is at work preparing hearts to receive Christ. That is to say that, that the, the Holy Spirit is the one who cultivates uh, the soil of our heart that the seed of faith uh, might, might uh, fall upon it and be received into it and might be nurtured and, and, and bear fruit. Uh, we see that the Spirit of God is at work by revealing and confirming Jesus to be who, uh, who Jesus actually is and who uh, who the gospel writers, who the church broadly uh, testifies Jesus to be, that namely that he is the Son of God and also the Christ. Uh, so when Jesus is given the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he reads that passage of scripture that says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and then proceeds to say, today this is fulfilled in your hearing. We can say, as, as hearers of the gospel, we can say, amen, amen, truly it is so. It is so because we had just heard, <laughs> we just heard a chapter ago how the Holy Spirit fell upon you, Jesus, uh, at your baptism. So yes, we can say, truly the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. Finally, we see the Holy Spirit uh, is at work by actually being the engine, the driving force of the gospel. That is to say that the gospel is advancing because of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so Luther writes in his explanation of the third article of the Creed on, that whole, on the person of the Holy Spirit, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit calls me through the gospel, enlightens me with his gifts, sanctifies and keeps me in true faith. This is to say that the Holy Spirit prepares our hearts to receive Christ, reveals Christ to us, and thus becomes the means through which the gospel takes root in our lives. It is also to say that I cannot believe Jesus to be the Christ, the Redeemer and Savior of the world, without the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, Jesus seems like just another guy, mighty indeed, yes, uh, wise, uh, beyond wise, even in his teachings. But to say more than that, we, we can't do that without the Holy Spirit. 
you know, all this talk of the Holy Spirit, it's great, it's exciting stuff. But we see in our text that uh, just because the Spirit's at work doesn't mean that everything is coming up roses. There are some, uh, some people who are coming up against the gospel in, in a rather uh, rough way. As our gospel reading begins, Jesus returns to Galilee and the people are talking about him. Luke doesn't tell us what they're talking about, but they are talking about him. Based solely on this gospel, we might uh, think that this is uh, the baptism of, hey, did you see that baptism when Jesus got dunked there in the river Jordan and the Spirit? Spirit came down, that dove uh, came down upon him. Maybe that's what we're talking about. If we go to uh, John's Gospel, we hear about Jesus uh, performing his first miracle uh, at the wedding feast at Cana in Galilee, that uh, popular of all miracles, the turning water into wine. Uh, maybe that's what people are talking about. We're, we're just not told. We're not told. But nonetheless, people are, at least not in Luke's gospel, we're not told. Uh, but people are seeing and they are some, sensing something going on with Jesus. And people are turning out to hear him, to teach in the synagogues. And, and, and he is earning the praise of everyone. He is earning the praise of everyone until he gets to hometown Nazareth. I want to, before going to Nazareth, I want to, pause and ask the question what are we talking about with, when it comes to Jesus outside of this hour that we spend together and the time we spend in, in Bible studies what, what are we talking about with Jesus are we talking about Jesus are we talking about the things that he said the things that he did the things that he is still doing today at the point in time that Jesus is walking on earth, uh, even at the point in time in which uh, St. Luke is writing his account of the gospel just a couple of decades later, Jesus is new. The gospel is new. And let's face it, new things are exciting to talk about, right? Uh, a new movie or a new video game that gets released. Uh, uh, a new gadget you may have gotten at Christmas, a new restaurant that opens in town, uh, a car or a home that you bought, whether it's uh, actually like new, new, or whether it's new to you, there, there's still a newness factor and an excitement about that. Jesus and the gospel, let's face it, they aren't all that new anymore, at least not for those of us who have grown up in the church and heard these stories over and over and over again. Perhaps some of this newness factor has worn off for us. And let's face it. Well, nobody talks about old news. What happens? What happens when the good news becomes old news? How do you rekindle some of that, that excitement and that wonder when the gospel is new to you? What are you talking about when you talk about Jesus? God likens his relationship to his people uh, as a marriage. It's a common common theme. Uh, what happens in marriage when the newness factor wears off? When, when, uh, when, when the honeymoon phase is over? Huh? What do you do then? There's got to be something deeper beneath the newness factor to make a marriage work, right? But there's got to be something deeper. There's got to be some substance beneath it. It's the same with faith. There's got to be substance beneath it, with it, to, to, uh, to weather, uh, uh, weather the storms uh, that come about, to see you beyond the newness factor when it becomes... Um, 
when, when that newness thing wears off. The psalmist says that the mercies of God come to us new each morning. We may not always ex- we may not experience that mercy in kind of the, the newness factor sort of a way. But when we understand the work of God, the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of Christ, forgiving sins, sustaining us, uh, giving us hope and, and, and peace within, uh, calling us to repentance, find, identifying those ways in which our lives are not shaped the way in God, that God wants them to be and gives us something to work on, uh, not only gives us something to work on, but actually works on it in us. These are ways in which, in which uh, faith and the life of faith is sustained and renewed. You know, we had a lot of people um, in the opening passage were speaking his praises, but other people not liking it, not liking what he had to say so much. So Jesus has returned to his hometown, Nazareth, the place where he grew up. He goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. That is to say that he, he kept that third commandment religiously to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And he read from the prophet Isaiah. And he rolls it up and he sits down to speak. We're used to people standing up, like I'm standing up right now, right? But in those days, you sat down you, to assume the... Uh, the uh, position of a rabbi, and from there you speak. He says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Today it is fulfilled in your hearing. This passage from Isaiah, from centuries and centuries before, where Christ is the speaker, saying the Spirit of the Lord is is presently upon me, Now Jesus says that is fulfilled in your hearing. That which happened in eternity has now happened in time. The Spirit of God is upon him. And the people are ooing and awing because this is just, isn't it so great that Jesus has grown up to be such a good and wise Jewish man? Many of the people at the synagogue would have watched Jesus grow up. Many of them may well have been his friends, having gone to Sabbath school uh, with him. Then comes verse 22. They said, isn't this Joseph's son? And with that question, you can feel the tide of favor starting to change. The newness factor goes like that. (laughs) It's gone. On the one hand, uh, this question may have been a, a fond remembrance of, hey, isn't that Joseph's son? Isn't that the kid they left behind in the temple when he was 12 years old? On the other hand, on the other hand, there may be some accusation in this question. Wait a minute. Isn't that Joseph's son? For those who knew their scriptures, this passage from Isaiah is a very explicit Messianic text. As we heard uh, back in December, uh, what the Hebrew says there is, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He has messiahed me. He has messiahed me. For Jesus then to say, this is fulfilled in your hearing, is for him to say, I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. I am the anointed one of God. For this for us, we have the benef- who have the benefit of having heard these first four chap- first three uh, chapters, four chapters of Luke's gospel, uh, we, we've seen how uh, this is a very true statement, uh, that Jesus is not born biologically from Joseph, but rather he's conceived of the Holy Spirit. And we had the baptism, the Holy Spirit coming upon him. You are my son, my beloved, with you I am well pleased. But for this audience to whom Jesus is speaking, he does not have the benefit of that. Or they do not have the benefit of, of that. For them, he's just committed blasphemy. Yes, Joseph is his, his dad according to the law, but biologically, we know that G, the, Jesus' daddy is the Lord God. 
But again, that crowd is very unaware of the situation. So far as they're concerned, he just committed blasphemy, attributing qualities of God upon a person, in this case, upon himself. Now the crowd turns. Now the crowd turns. And they try to, they escort him out to the edge of, of, of the hill on which uh, their city was built to try and throw him over the cliffs. Because that's what you do, what they did then when one committed blasphemy. Jesus, of course, has not committed blasphemy. He is truly the Son of God. And he comes for this purpose, as he read from the prophet Isaiah, to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is his mission statement. It is why he is here. When the newness factors wear off, wears off, we have a mission. We, are, we can be sustained in this faith by, our, by the mission which Christ has given to us. Mission, we, we, we best know this in Matthew 28, to baptize, uh, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all I have commanded you, right? Well, what has he commanded us? What is it that he has commanded us? He, he, he commissions us to carry on his work. So in the, in the, God's, uh, at the, excuse me, at the end of John's Gospel, he breathes on the apostles the Holy Spirit, and he says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. He had breathed the Holy Spirit. He spoke those words upon them. We call it the office of the keys. That's where we are. Sustained. We might be sustained in this faith when the newness factor wears off. Is the ongoing work that he has given to us to proclaim this gospel, this good news of freedom and of release and of comfort to those who have not yet heard or those who have heard but have forgotten. It's amazing how this old, old news becomes new news in the times we need it most. When we need to be forgiven, this new news comes to us. I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And man, those are sweet words to hear. When the weights and trials of life have us worn down to hear that Christ came for us, that Christ bears the, this brokenness in his body and that he puts it to death with him and raises us up to new life. Those are sweet words. They can be hard to believe, but they are sweet words to hear. And the gospel comes to us in this case. It come, becomes new again. So the psalmist says, as I mentioned before, God's mercies come to us new each day. Each day, God is forgiving us our sins. He is each day taking the, our brokenness upon him. Right? The sacrifice of God is a broken and contrite heart. We lay our brokenness upon him. And we receive his healing mercies. In this way, the church is sustained in this good news. And people are, are, are brought in. And this news becomes uh, good news for them as well. As they, as they hear and they receive it. And, and the, the Holy Spirit cultivates this faith in them. That God truly does love them. That he truly does care about them. He truly does love and care about you. That's why he, his angels declared uh, in Luke 2 at the first Christmas, peace among those whom he favors. And may that peace of God guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. <laughs>
his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. There is one in Christ Jesus. Let us pray for the church, for the world, and for all people according to their needs. Lord Jesus, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one of God, who not only brought the good news, but who is himself the good news of salvation. You proclaim release from all that holds us captive. You make us to see those places where we are blind. You free us from all that oppresses us. You proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Please, Lord, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear how you are bringing good news into the world. Open our mouths that we may be proclaimers of that good news. Let us never take offense at your teaching, your word, or your work, but gladly hear, learn, and obey it. And those places where we are offended, humble us, that we might repent and become shaped by you, to become more like you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord God, all praise, honor, and glory belong to you. You made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. You keep faith forever. You execute justice for the oppressed. You give food to the hungry. You set the prisoner free. You open the eyes of the blind and lift up those who are bowed down. 
You watch over the stranger and uphold the orphan and the widow. You bring to ruin the ways of the wicked. Let us never put our trust in mortals in whom there is no help, but let us forever joyfully sing of your praises. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In this coming week, O Lord, as our nation inaugurates a new president into office, we pray for a peaceful transition of power. We pray your blessing and wisdom on all the leadership of our country, the president, the congress, the judges, governors, mayors, and all other leaders. Lead and guide them in their terms of office so that they would govern as servants, knowing that they are not empowered to be served, but to serve the people who have elected them to those offices. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Great physician, in your compassion, hear our prayers for those who suffer disease of wound and wounds of mind, body, and spirit. We especially lift before you those who suffer the effects of this pandemic. Strengthen and encourage our first responders, nurses, doctors, and others who serve to bring and restore health to the sick. Console those who mourn for those who have died. Inspire people to sacrifice their own desires in ways that protect others who are weaker than they. Look with compassion upon all those for whom we lift before you, for whom we have great concern. Hear your people as we lift these names to you now, either out loud or in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. It is into your hands, O Lord, that we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts now to receive our Lord as he comes to us in his holy supper. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth. In mercy for our fallen world, you gave your only Son, that all who believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. We give thanks to you for the salvation you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send now your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that we may receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us now in his holy supper. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Beloved of the Lord, on the night when he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you, this do in remembrance of me. And in the same manner he took the cup and giving thanks, blessed it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Take, eat, the body of Christ given for you. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Your sins are truly forgiven. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you in faith and keep you in his grace unto life everlasting. Amen. Will you join with me now in our closing song?
Receive now the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm.